How's it going everyone, Michael here. So today in this video, I'm gonna go over the graph problem surrounded regions. This problem is currently asked at Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and Bloomberg. This problem is definitely medium to hard difficulty because you kind of have to think outside of the box to solve it, and there are multiple approaches to solve it. Before I get into the video, I wanted to let you all know that I created a public Discord channel. So if you are studying, interviewing, or just you know like my tutorials, feel free to come join the channel and I'm gonna try to be active in there as well. The link for that will be in the description. So without further ado, let's get into the problem. For this problem, we are given a matrix containing only the characters X and O. And we have to flip all O's into X's, which are four directionally surrounded by X's. So if we look at this example, we have all X's and O's in this matrix, and this section of O's would be flipped since the entire section is surrounded by X's horizontally and vertically. This single O is left alone since below it, there is no X, hence it is not fully surrounded. So to solve this problem, we can do it using a BFS or DFS. Both end up having the same time complexity, so it doesn't really matter which one you do, but for this video, I'm gonna go over both approaches so that it's well understood. Before we jump into BFS or DFS, we have to know which O's should be flipped or not. So looking at this example, we essentially have four different groups of O's that are connected horizontally or vertically. After running our algorithm, this group would be flipped because there are X's around the group, and this group would be flipped for the same reason, all X's surrounding it. These other two groups would be left alone though. Notice what these two non-flip groups have in common both are touching the border of the matrix. So what this boils down to is, if we have a group of O's that touches the border of our matrix, we do not flip them. Any group of O's not touching the border, we will flip to X's. So this is really the hardest part of this problem, is just being able to identify that groups of O's that are touching the border should not be flipped. First, we are going to loop over our borders of the matrix and determine if we need to perform a DFS or a BFS. Starting at position 00, zero we do have a character O, which means we do need to start a DFS or BFS at this position. We need to change position 00, zero to a character that is not an X or an O, because at the end of performing our search, we need to know which group of O's would be flipped. So any group of O's that are on the border, we're going to flip to another character. And you can choose whatever character you want, but I'm gonna choose the character M. So starting at position 00, zero we're going to flip this character to an M and check if any of our neighbors are O's as well. So up and to the left are out of bounds, right and below are X's, so that means our search stops. Looping over the rest of this top border, they're all X's, so we don't have to perform any search on the top border. Now we're gonna loop over the left border, and none of these characters are O's. We do have an M, but we already flipped that group, so we don't need to perform any search on the left border either. The right border also has all X's, so we're gonna do nothing. Finally, in our bottom border, we eventually find another character O, which means we perform another DFS or BFS on this group. Starting at position 4-2, we flip it to an M, since we have an O at this position. We will check all of our neighbors to see if they are also O's, so to the left and the right, we have X's, below is out of bounds, but above us is another O. So keep in mind, if we're using a DFS, we will just be making further recursive calls, while if we're using a BFS, we will be adding another coordinate inside of our queue. Now we're at position 3, 2. So we flip this position to an M and continue our search. The top and right are X's, 
and below is an M, which means we already visited that position. To the left of us is another O, so we visit that position. Now we're at position 3, 1, and we're going to flip this position to an M, and we see that none of our other neighbors are O's, so our search is going to stop here. Notice our grid has the groups on the border flipped to M's. So the last step is just to flip any M's back to O's and any O's to X's. Since if there was an O in the grid, that means it was completely surrounded by X's. Once we do that, we are left with the following matrix. And as you can see, any O's that are still in the grid, their group is touching the border. All right, so let's go over the code for this solution. I'm gonna go over the DFS approach first. So we are given a 2D matrix called board, and inside this board, we have characters that are either X's or O's. So the first thing we need to do is loop over all of our borders in the matrix, and anytime we encounter a character O, we are going to start a DFS. So to do that, we're gonna need our rows and columns. So we'll say int M, equals board dot length and n equals board at index zero dot length. Next, what we're gonna need to do is loop over our left and right borders. So how would we loop over only the left and right borders? If you think about it, our columns would have to be fixed. It would have to be the same column number, like the position, and then the row position would change, but the column position would not. So in order to do that, we have to loop over all of our rows, which in this case is M. So we'd say four in I equals zero, I is less than M, I plus plus. And we're going to need to have a separate helper function that will actually perform our DFS for us. So what we can do is we're gonna come down here and we're gonna say private void and what is this DFS function going to do? It's going to mark the board because remember any O's that are on the border, that means that we need to change them to another character. So I'm gonna call this helper function mark board. So I just wrote out the method signature for this helper function. The first parameter is going to be our board. The second and third parameter is going to be the rows and columns. And then the last parameters are going to be the current position that we are looking at. So if we go back to this for loop, we're going to call mark board. And we're going to call board with M and N. And then I, in this case, of our mark board parameter, that's going to be the row number. And since we're trying to loop over all of the rows but fix our columns, we're going to set this position to I, but then our J is going to be at zero. And so if you think about what this is doing, we're looping over all of our rows, but our column number is always staying at zero. And so this is technically the left border. We are looping over only the left border for this helper function call. Similarly, we're going to call mark board again. So we're going to say board, M, N, I. And now we need to loop over the right border. And to do that, we just do N minus one. So this is the right border because N is the number of columns we have. So we just subtract it by one. Pretty simple so far, but now we need to loop over the top and bottom borders as well. So to do that, we actually need to loop over our columns this time, but we need to fix our row. So we're just doing the opposite from what we did uh, in the first for loop. So we're gonna say int i, zero, i is less than n, i plus plus, and we are going to call our helper function again, mark board, pass in the board, m, n, but now our row positions are going to be fixed. So we're gonna set this to zero, and then our column is going to be I. And so this is technically looping over the top border now. And then we're gonna call mark board again with board M, N, and we're gonna do M minus one and I. 
and this is going to be the bottom border. So with both of these loops, we are looping over only the border elements. And now we need to actually implement this mark board function. So we need to think of what are some edge cases that we could run into because we are gonna be performing a DFS. So we can say if our I position is less than zero, or J is less than zero, or I is greater than or equal to M, or J is greater than or equal to N, or the board at position IJ is not equal to the character O, we can just immediately return from this recursive function. So these are all of our base cases, but if we make it past line 16, Th that means we know that the current position we're looking at for sure is a character O and it is a valid position. And if that's the case, we can immediately mark this position with whatever character we want. So we can say board at position IJ equals character M. Now we just need to check the left, right, up, and down positions to see if there's any other O's inside of this group. And a neat trick that I like to do whenever you need to check all directions is to just have a 2D integer matrix uh, called directions. So what this looks like is the following. I will paste it here. Inside of this 2D matrix, it, the ones will pretty much tell you which direction you're going to be going. So in the first example right here, one and zero, what this is saying is that the X coordinate is going to be increased by one. And when you increase the X coordinate by one, that's essentially moving your rows downward. And then same thing for this one, negative one, zero. Since the negative one is in the X position, this is going to be moving your rows upwards. So this is just a neat trick to kind of shorten the amount of code that you have to write. So we're gonna have a for loop and we're gonna loop over all of our directions. So we're gonna say int direction of directions. And we're gonna say int x equals direction at index zero plus i. And then y is going to be equal to direction at position one plus j. And now we just need to call mark board. So we're gonna say mark board of the board, M, N, X, and Y. And that's actually it for our DFS. It's very, very simple. We're just checking all the directions in whether it's horizontally or vertically from the current position that we know is an O. So the last and final thing we need to do is flip the board back because we can't have M's in our final output. It should only be X's and O's. So anything that is an M, we're going to flip back to an O, and anything that is an O, we're going to flip back to an X. In our method signature, I have a function called flip board, and it's going to have our board and then just our rows and columns. So first we need to loop over this board. And now we just check the position. So if board, of i j is equal to character m, then board i j is going to be equal to character o, else if board at i j is equal to an o, then board at i j is going to be equal to an x. And then finally, we just need to call this function. So we're gonna come back up to our solve method and say flip board, board, M, and N. And that is it. So we just had to use two helper functions, mark board and flip board, and this will solve the problem. So let's run it just to make sure that we didn't make any mistakes. What? What the fuck? Ah, it's because I put I++ here. This needs to be J. So let's submit one more time. <laughs> So that was the DFS approach. Now let's go over the BFS approach. And what's cool about, you know, whether you decide to do DFS or BFS, you only have to change the mark board function. 
the solve function can stay the same, and the flip board function can stay the same. It's just a different way to perform your search. So instead of using recursion like we did for DFS, we're just going to use a queue now. So the first thing we need to do is when we come into mark board, we only want to have character O's inside of our queue. So we can say if board at position IJ is not equal to the character O, then we can just return immediately. So if we make it past line 21, then we know we have a character O and we can immediately flip that value. So we're going to say board i j equals character m and now we're going to initialize our queue and we're going to add the 1d coordinate inside of our queue so we'll say queue dot add i times n plus j so what this is doing is it's taking my i and j coordinates which is a 2D coordinate, and I'm converting it to a 1D coordinate. So I can just deal with integers instead of, you know, pairs or integer arrays for my Q values. Once again, if any of this is confusing to you, converting 2D coordinates to 1D coordinates, I have another video that goes over all of this, and you can check that out. But for now, what we need to do now is loop over our Q values. Now we need to just pull from our queue. So we'll say int position equals queue.pull. And keep in mind that position in this case is a 1D coordinate, and we need to convert it back to a 2D coordinate. So to do that, we can say row equals position, and we're going to divide it by n. And then our column number is going to be position modulus n. So now we have our 2D coordinate back. From here, we're going to loop over our directions array, just like how we did in the DFS approach. And so if x is greater than negative 1, and y is greater than negative 1, and x is less than m, and y is less than n, and our board at x, y is equal to a character O. After all of that, we just need to add to our queue. So we can say queue.add x times n plus y, because this is converting it back to a 1D coordinate. And then we also need to mark this position, because we know it's an O. So we can say board at x, y equals the character m. And that's it. That is our BFS approach. So as you can see, it's the same idea as the DFS. It's just we're using a queue now instead of recursion. So let's submit. So our time complexity for the BFS approach is going to be big O of M times N, where M is our rows and N is our columns. In the worst case, we would have our entire grid as O's, which means we would have to touch every single cell a single time. And then as for the space complexity, it's going to be big O of the minimum between M and N, because in the worst case, if we have all O's, as we are adding O positions inside of our queue, we will also be removing from our queue. So it will only fill up to the minimum of either our rows or our columns. As for our DFS approach, our time complexity is going to be big O of M times N for the same reason as BFS. In the worst case, we have to touch every cell a single time. And then our space complexity, this is actually different from our BFS approach because in the worst case, it will be big O of M times N. If we have all O's, due to recursion, our stack space will fill up to however many cells we have inside of our grid. Feel free to check out this playlist of graph problems if you feel like you need more practice with these types of problems. Also, come join the free Discord channel. It's still new, but I'm going to be you know, pretty active in it and try to interact with you all because the community has just grown a lot. So that's a wrap for this video, and I'll catch you later.